What is up, everybody? My name is Daniel Curran, and I'm the creator here at BoldWolves.com. And today, we're going to be doing something different. I'm going to be giving a kind of thorough review of the top 11 ideas that I personally got out of reading this book called Shoe Dog, a memoir by the creator of Nike. So pretty much the person that started Nike, Swoosh, You've seen them everywhere around the world by now. Billion, billion dollar company. I think that he's, I think, 76 or a little bit older than that, worth $25 billion. And how does one go from an Oregon living in your parents at 24 years old to being 76 and starting a company that pretty much has changed the world, right? Changed the world and how we look at shoes, athletic wear, running, sports, athletes, and everything. So I'm going to start right away and jump into the number one idea. And the number one idea that I got from this is that it always starts with a crazy idea. You know, it's an idea that's based on a lack of something, an idea that is pushed forward by kind of like a dissatisfaction of the status quo. You're not, you're not, you're not satisfied with where you are right now. It could be from, I don't necessarily recommend this, but sometimes it gets sparked by a comparison about someone that had a similar opportunity to you and maximizes opportunity, and you did not through lack of action of something that was within your control. So you had the power to do something, but you didn't do it. Or your kind of history and your future is predetermined for you, and you don't really feel connected to it. You know, that could be another way. But it all comes down to, like, there's a breaking point when enough is is enough. And Phil talks about this as soon as he starts into the book. Immediately. He's 24 years old, living in Oregon, where pretty much, like, nothing great has ever happened. Is the the way he kind of put it. But Oregon people really stick together. Um, And he talks about how he realized that there was just like a lack of time. And it was a recurring theme throughout the book where he was really motivated by time. And he wanted to live over, at the very end of the book, he even talks about how he wanted to relive over all the failures, all the mistakes, all the whole, the whole ride and journey together because it was truly, truly a fun and amazing ride. But back to point number one where it all starts with a crazy idea. This is what he said. He said he wanted his life to be meaningful purposeful and creative, but most importantly, above everything else, he wanted it to be different. And this is something that everyone here at Bold Wolves, including myself, can really relate to, is the need almost, the the not, it's like more than a want, it's like a need to be different and a need, uh, wanting to zag when other people zig. When everyone's doing something, it doesn't mean it's bad. Like, a lot of people right now are starting to get into meditation. That's a good thing. At least, personally, in my opinion, it's a very good thing. It could do massive changes into your life. But overall, when everyone's everyone's trying to be an accountant, let's say, maybe you have to use some healthy skepti- skepti- skepticism <laughs> to kind of, like, double-check if that's what you really, really want. So when he had this crazy idea, he wanted his life to be meaningful, purposeful, and creative, and different, different than everyone else. So think about ways where are you being creative in your life? Is your life having meaning? And a lot of people, when it comes to meaning, it's like, I have to change the world. And as Biggie Small so eloquently put, you can change the world if you change yourself. If you do one act of kindness, you are changing the world on a micro level. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be millions and millions of people. But... It had to be purposeful, creative, meaningful, and different. Those were the four things that Phil Knight, the creator of Nike, talked about when he was 24, broke, living in his parents' basement, I think it was, in in the, the quarters, downstairs quarters, living in his quarters, just graduating school, not wanting to do anything. Those were the four things that he, that hit him, struck him when he was going on his daily six mile run. Lesson number two was from the ancient wisdom from the Persian poet Rumi. So this is not directly from Phil himself, but Phil alluded to it multiple, multiple times during the book. And this type of advice and 
full transparency, I personally have not yet done this. However, I have scheduled it within the next two weeks to do it. And it comes from the Persian poet Rumi, who said, and I quote, Don't go to sleep one night. Don't go to sleep one night. What you most want will come to you then. Warmed by the sun, inside you'll see wonders. So pretty much, don't go to sleep one night. Do some introspective work, and whatever has been eluding you or the answer that you seek will come to you. So I love my sleep, but I'm definitely going to be scheduling this in the next two weeks. And maybe I'll do a follow-up depending on the amount of people that request it. But number two, ancient wisdom. Do something radical. If you're at a crossroads in your life and you want one of the four things that Phil mentioned in lesson number one, meaningful, purposeful, creative, and being different, or all four together, then perhaps you should take Rumi's advice and don't go to sleep one night and what you most want will come to you then. Lesson number three that I personally took was the emphasis on gratitude and beauty. A lot of times during this book, Phil talks about how grateful he is, especially at the start of his career, and especially at the end, but at the start of his career, he did something radical from a boy, 24, living with his parents in kind of like a suburb area in Oregon where no one really goes outside the state let alone the county, he decided to travel the world, including Hawaii, Asia, Japan, etc. While traveling, he really so eloquently put a lot of his understanding of beauty. And this is the quote that he had. He said that, if you get simple beauty and not else, not much else, you get the best thing God invents. So I definitely agree with this. It's a great reminder to myself, and I hope that you take this to heart, is that it's perfectly fine to just be like, take some time out of your day to just be taken aback by the natural beauty. It could be just looking up at the clouds. Sometimes clouds, like yesterday, the clouds were extremely poofy. It just looked like they were like giant marshmallows. It had like a million layers, and they weren't even that large. And I just looked at it, and I just kind of froze for three, four seconds, and then I went back to getting into my car. But something like that, where you're just taken aback, looking for beauty, and you will find it because it is everywhere. And when I was reading Stephen Kotler's book about the flow and how to get into flow and how flow is pretty much the secret to happiness, and we'll get into that in other videos, he said that on a low, low level, flow is getting taken away by beauty. So when you see something beauty, it could be art, it could be at a museum, it could be nature, it could be a sculpture, it could be uh, technology, it could be, it could be anything creative that just takes you back. Be Allow yourself to be taken into that flow state because, first of all, that will give you massive happiness and it is very, very good for you. So lesson number three, gratitude beauty. Be grateful for wherever you are in your life and appreciate the beauty like Phil so eloquently put. It's the best thing that God invents. So a lot of it comes down to Phil's, you know, he, he led a team. He had some good people around him and they were like a team all from Oregon. They supported each other. And this was Phil's philosophy on leadership and management especially. Phil Knight, creator of Nike's management philosophy, summed up with, don't tell people how to do things. Tell them what to do and let them surprise you with their results. And from my personal takeaway, it worked and it didn't work. It was kind of like an almost Phil Jackson Zen approach by dealing with things in their own way, by letting most problems, unless they were really, really severe, kind of fizzle out and let them people deal with their own stuff on their own time. So I know that Phil and, <laughs> that's funny, both of them are named Phil. Phil Jackson and Phil Knight probably have the same, very similar philosophy. So don't tell people how to do things. Tell them what to do and let them surprise you with their results. It reminds me of this other quote where the person that knows 
how to do something will always have a job, but the person that knows why will always be the boss. So Phil's management, take it if you want, leave it if you don't. I personally say that a fine balance with giving people space, however, explaining the why is a huge, huge benefit in my personal style of leadership. So yeah, number five, salesmanship. So, number five was, Phil talks about how, you know, if if you have a business, you have a product, it's very important that you know how to sell, sell yourself, sell your company, sell your product, the best product in the world will not go anywhere if you're not selling it, right? It doesn't do anyone any good if it's all in a warehouse somewhere. So, he talks about how he's really, really shy growing up, even when he's 76 years old, worth $25 billion, and he randomly meets uh, while sitting down in this theater, and I think it was Coral Springs or something like that, and he was sitting in this theater with his wife, Penny, enjoying eating popcorn, They the movie stops, they get out on the right, go down the aisle, come back up, and next thing you know, they, there's two familiar faces approaching them. This was Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, who were at that same movie. As you know, these are the two richest people in the entire world. And Phil even writes about how he was nervous at that moment. He was shy. He said something really stupid, etc., etc. So he was especially shy when he was growing up and when he had $25 billion, which is very interesting. And he started off by selling encyclopedias, um, and failed. He couldn't sell like one of them, and he tried and tried and tried. And it was a job based on commission, so he did very bad. Then he went into mutual funds, and he tried it. He did a little bit better, but he just it was, it was rejection. And he hated he hated the rejection, and it was very very difficult for him. So when it came down to shoes, when it came down to shoes, selling shoes was not hard at all, and he was really, really surprised because he had no success in his entire life in any type of salesmanship endeavor. And this is the quote that he talks about. Because I realized I wasn't selling. I believed in running. I believe that if people go out and ran a few miles every day, the world would be a better place. And I believed that those, that these were better to run it. So he believed in his product. I believe that these were better to run it. People, sensing my belief, wanted some of that belief for themselves. Wow. When I read this, I literally put the book down and really thought about this. Because when you truly understand and you believe in something with your whole heart, there, there's you're not selling anymore. You're just like, listen, like, dude, this I believe in this with all my heart. I don't need to sell you because I already I, take it or leave it. You're welcome for even offering this product. You know, when you're coming from that frame, from that mindset, it's selling itself. When you know your worth, you know the worth of the shoes or the product or the service that you're creating, it sells itself. So I thought that was really, really interesting. So if you personally are not the best salesman or you are the best salesman, find something that you believe in and it will sell itself. All right, you're still going to have to do some selling, but... You know, when you truly believe it, people want to believe in things that other people believe in. All right? That's number five, salesmanship. Number six was to celebrate the Mount Fuji principle. And this is something I took from him. The Mount Fuji principle is something when he was at first in Japan and he had a deal. He he had a meeting with the main shoe supplier of the Tigers, the Onita Tawasa. I'm I'm not even going to try to say it. I have it written down. probably would get it right, but I don't have it in front of me right now, but when he was taking it on a tour around the city, he got to the Mount Fuji, and it's known to for celebrations, and for when people walk on there, and it's like a spiritual awakening, and you go in as soon as it's sunrise in the very morning, and this, there's this whole thing, the type of shoes that you wear, etc., etc., etc. He was about to go on it during the tour, and then he decided, no, I'm not going to go on it right now. I'm only going to come back here, and I'm going to celebrate my deal. So he ended up closing the deal, 
He ended up closing a one or three year contract with this shoe provider. And he's 20, 25 year old kid from Oregon, doesn't even have a home base or employees, signs a three year deal to be the main supplier in America. And that's when he goes and to Mount Fuji, climbs the whole thing, and celebrates it. Here at Bull Wolves, we call it Gatorade dumping, which is the principle where after a football game or a basketball game, etc., etc., the coach or a good player gets dumped on by Gatorade in celebration. So create a process. This is something that I teach to all private clients that I haven't really talked about in my previous videos or my newsletters, where after you've worked hard effort-wise and things within your control and you had a big win or even small wins, there has to be some type of feedback loop of Gatorade dumping. Congratulate yourself. Celebrate. Friends, family, whatever it takes. Celebrate, celebrate, celebrate when it's needed. Gatorade dumping, the Mount Fuji principle. Number six. Number seven. Phil's leadership style. We talked about his management style earlier, but Phil's leadership style, he compared business to war. And he said that business is war without bullets. Business is war without the bullets. So what did he do? He would constantly read and meet with generals to game plan. He would meet with generals, ask them for advice. He met with like the, the Vietnam communist general, the famous one at the very end of his life. He would constantly read, read, read anything war, strategy, and planning. This is very, very good because life is a strategy and learning these mindsets of war, if you're creating a business, $25 billion Nike founder and creator Phil Knight says that business is like war and he made $25 billion. So you might know a thing or two and his business success, his leadership style was with a mindset of war. So study general, study battle, study that whole thing. And see how that helps you maximize your profits. Number eight is advice. So pretty much throughout the book, and he went through so many failures, so many close calls. For years at end, his business was maybe a day or two days every week from completely run like from completely going bankrupt and losing the equity that he had. And not having a month money to pay anything. And pretty much any day Nike or Blue Ribbon, as it was originally called, could have failed. For four years or more. And he would constantly, constantly, constantly call people and ask for advice. What needs to be done? Let me hear your opinion. He was not overconfident and he appreciated advice from his friends from anyone. He would ask lawyers if they knew anyone up. He would send letters to random CEOs. He would do anything that he could to get advice to make the best possible decision. So don't be afraid when you're in a predicament, hear advice. You know, don't be afraid to make decisions at the same time. Have a kind of a balance between the two. But at the understand that it takes a real person, a real man to ask for advice and make sure that you're not asking as I think in uh, The Richest Man in Babylon, it talks about don't go to the sheep herder for stock advice. Ask the right people for the right advice, but ask for advice. Number nine, the ninth lesson I took from Shoe Dog, Phil Knight's memoir, is creativity. Which alludes to the first point, but creativity. And there's this little story I wanted to share with you. It's funny. Because his partner at the time, Bowerman, who was this track legend, 49% to Phil's 51 at the time before he kind of let, let things go. And Bowerman was a shoe genius. He literally created the first waffle shoe by putting rubber into a waffle maker and breaking a couple of them. But it, insane. So he created this kind of legendary new shoe with new technology that no one's ever seen before. And they were going to call it the Aztec. And back then, they were still called Blue Ribbon, and they were not the they were not the Nike that we know them now. They were still a small fledgling company, barely surviving week in and week out. But he created the shoe, the Aztec, and it was incredible. Demand was immediate. 
Everyone wanted it. And Adidas threatened to sue them. Because apparently a year ago they created a shoe called the Aztec something something something. The name wasn't even that similar. But they threatened to sue them and they were really bummed out because they wanted to call it the Aztec. Why did they want to call it the Aztec? Because the 1972 Olympics were being held in New Mexico and they wanted to make a showing there. 1972 Olympics, Aztec. So what did they do? Phil Bowerman, late one night, on his porch, which was pretty much like at the top of this mountain in Oregon. Uh, it was like after, late at late in the evening, they were like, what should we name it? Fuck, what, what's going on? Uh, I can't believe Adidas would do this. And then, and then Bowerman looked at Phil and he's like, wait a minute. What was that general that destroyed the Aztecs? And it was Cortez. So what did they do? They named their shoe the Cortez. And Adidas came out with the Aztec. And it was just like a little rivalry, which is always good. Competition is always good in that sense. And it's super interesting because that's how, that's creativity. All right, that's creativity. Another way that Nike stood out was every shoe box back then was either white or blue. So what did he do? He had neon green, neon orange, crazy orange shoe boxes to stand out so people would remember them. And he wanted it to be different. That's the key. And so when he first set out, like his lesson number one, it always starts with a crazy idea. Lesson number one that we first talked about, he wanted his life to be meaningful, purposeful, creative, but above all else, different. So what does Phil do? What could we learn from this? We could learn to see the status quo and the environment of whatever business we're in, but whether a lifestyle we're living, what is everyone doing? What are the high achievers doing? What is my competition doing? Now, how can I be different? How can I separate myself from the pack? So they created orange boxes and it really helped their sales. Lesson number 10 is character and integrity. A thing that I really liked to book is that Phil talked about some moments where, you know, you didn't, it, was, it wasn't really, really good. You know, there was times when he snuck into his rival's briefcase and stole papers or lied about starting a company to his rival. Or there was reasons where he, but it was a recurring theme that I noticed where every time he broke the rules, even though if it was, and he lied or broke the rules, it would always be a temporary win for like maybe a year or something. But it would always come back to haunt him horribly, whether it be in court or financially or having to pay a tax or whatnot. So the lesson is, the lesson that we could take from this is don't, first of all, be honest. You know what I mean? The lesson is that we're always remembered by the mistakes and the, the rules that we break. But we're always forgiven in truth. So yeah, we make mistakes. We're not fucking perfect. But we're always forgiven the truth. And it's better to not even be forgiven in anything. Just tell the truth. It's a light weight over your shoulders that Mark Twain is that he always has to forget everything because he always tells the truth. Right? So that's lesson number 10. So number 11, the last lesson that I'm going to share with you from Shoe Dog Memoir, of Phil Knight, creator of Nike, is that it's time to make decisions. Number 11, make decisions. He didn't love the name Nike, he didn't love the swooch, but they didn't have a better alternative, so they just liked it. They brainstormed for four days, there were this, this, and finally came down to it, and they was like, you know what, let's just do Nike, fuck it, let's just do the swoosh. They didn't love it at the time. It doesn't have to be some miracle idea. Sometimes it's very good to be a good enoughist. This is an idea I learned from Brian Johnson. To be a good enough is to be like, listen, this idea is good enough. If anything, they could change it. You know what I mean? But when you put all your heads together, after you ask for advice, when it's time to make a decision, it's time to make a decision. You don't have to, it, it doesn't have to be perfect. Make the decision, ride the momentum that comes from making decisions, and you'll be good. So thank you for listening to this recap of the lessons that I took away from Shoe Dog, a memoir creative Nike. I highly recommend you read it. You won't be able to put it down. It was written very, very well. A lot of book. It made me feel inspired. It made me feel sad. 
made me put it down, bring it back up, couldn't fall asleep. It was a very, very good book. That's why I wanted to share all these lessons with you as well. So I'm going to end this video with a quote from Phil Knight himself. <clears throat> I tell men and women in their mid-twenties not to settle for a job or a profession or even a career. Seek a calling. Even if you don't know what that means, seek it. If you're following your calling, the fatigue will be easier to bear. The disappointments will be fuel. And the highs will be like nothing you've ever felt before. So with that being said, hope you're wearing some Nikes right now, and I'll see you soon.